The history of the Roman constitution is a study of ancient Rome that traces the progression of Roman political development from the founding of the city of Rome in 753 BC to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire in 476 AD. The constitution of the Roman kingdom vested the sovereign power in the king of Rome. The king did have two rudimentary checks on his authority, which took the form of a board of elders and a popular assembly. The arrangement was similar to the constitutional arrangements found in contemporary Greek city-states. These Greek constitutional principles probably came to Rome through the Greek colonies of Magna Graecia in southern Italy. The Roman kingdom was overthrown in 510 BC, according to legend, and in its place the Roman Republic was founded. The constitutional history of the Roman Republic can be divided into five phases. The first phase began with the revolution which overthrew the Roman kingdom in 510 BC, and the final phase ended with the revolution which overthrew the Roman Republic, and thus created the Roman Empire, in 27 BC. Throughout the history of the Republic, the constitutional evolution was driven by the struggle between the aristocracy and the ordinary citizens. Approximately two centuries after the founding of the Republic, the plebeians attained, in theory at least, equality with the patricians. In practice, however, the plight of the average plebeian remained unchanged. This set the stage for the civil wars of the 1st century BC, and Rome's transformation into a formal empire. The general who won the last civil war of the Roman Republic, Gaius Octavian, became the master of the state. In the years after 30 BC, Octavian set out to reform the Roman constitution and to found the Principate. The ultimate consequence of these reforms was the abolition of the Republic and the founding of the Roman Empire. Octavian was given the honorific Augustus by the Roman Senate, and became known to history by this name and as the first Roman Emperor. Octavian's reforms did not, at the time, seem drastic, since they did nothing more than reorganize the constitution. The reorganization was revolutionary, however, because the ultimate result was that Octavian ended up with control over the entire constitution which itself set the stage for outright monarchy. When Diocletian became Roman Emperor in 284, the Principate was abolished, and a new system, the Dominate, was established. This system survived until the ultimate fall of the Eastern Roman Empire in 1453, under the Kingdom. The period of the Kingdom can be divided into two epochs based on the legends handed down to us principally in the first book of Livy's Aburb Condita. While the specific legends were probably not true, they were likely based on historical fact. It is likely that, before the founding of the Republic, Rome actually had been ruled by a succession of kings. The first legendary epoch saw the reigns of the first four legendary kings. During this time, the political foundations of the city were laid, the city grew increasingly organized, the religious institutions were established, and the Senate and the assemblies evolved into formal institutions. The early Romans were divided into three ethnic groups. The families that belonged to one of these ethnic groups were the original patrician families. In an attempt to add a level of organization to the city, these patrician families were divided into units called curia. The vehicle through which the early Romans expressed their democratic impulses was known as a committee. The two principal assemblies that formed were known as the curiate assembly and the collate assembly. The two assemblies were designed to mirror the ethnic divisions of the city, and as such, the assemblies were organized by curia. The vehicle through which the early Romans expressed their aristocratic impulses was a council of town elders, which became the Roman Senate. The elders of this council were known as paters, and thus are known to history as the first Roman senators. The demos and the elders eventually recognized the need for a single political leader, and thus elected such a leader, the rex. The demos elected the rex, and the elders advised the rex. The second epoch saw the reigns of the last three legendary kings. The second epoch was more consequential than was the first. 
which was in part due to the significant degree of territorial expansion which occurred during this period. Regardless of how true these legends were, it is likely that, as the legends suggest, a series of conquests did occur during the late monarchy. As a result of these conquests, it became necessary to determine what was to be done with the conquered people. Often, individuals whose towns had been conquered remained in those towns, while other such individuals came to Rome. To acquire legal and economic standing, these newcomers adopted a condition of dependency toward either a patrician family, or toward the king. Eventually, the individuals who were dependents of the king were released from their state of dependency, and became the first plebeians. As Rome grew, it needed more soldiers to continue its conquests. When the plebeians were released from their dependency, they were released from their curia. When this occurred, while they were no longer required to serve in the army, they also lost their political and economic standing. To bring these new plebeians back into the army, the patricians were forced to make concessions. While it is not known exactly what concessions were made, the fact that they were not granted any political power set the stage for what history knows as the conflict of the orders. The reign of the first four kings was distinct from that of the last three kings. The first kings were elected between the reigns of the final three kings, however, the monarchy became hereditary, and as such, the Senate became subordinated to the king. This breach in the Senate's sovereignty, rather than an intolerable tyranny, was probably what led the patricians in the Senate to overthrow the last king. The king may have sought the support of the plebeians, however, the plebeians were no doubt exhausted from their continued military service, and from their forced labor in the construction of public works. They were probably also embittered by their lack of political power, and therefore did not come to the aid of either the king or the Senate, under the Republic. After the monarchy had been overthrown, and the Roman Republic had been founded, the people of Rome began electing two consuls each year. In the year 494 BC, the plebeians seceded to the Aventine Hill, and demanded of the patricians the right to elect their own officials. The patricians duly capitulated, and the plebeians ended their secession. The plebeians called these new officials plebeian tribunes, and gave these tribunes two assistants, called plebeian edler. In 449 BC, the Senate promulgated the Twelve Tables as the centerpiece of the Roman constitution. In 443 BC, the office of censor was created, and in 367 BC, plebeians were allowed to stand for the consulship. The opening of the consulship to the plebeian class implicitly opened both the censorship as well as the dictatorship to plebeians. In 366 BC, in an effort by the patricians to reassert their influence over the magisterial offices, two new offices were created. While these two offices, the praetorship and the curula aedileship, were at first open only to patricians within a generation, they were open to plebeians as well. Beginning around the year 350 BC, the senators and the plebeian tribunes began to grow closer. The senate began giving tribunes more power, and, unsurprisingly, the tribunes began to feel indebted to the senate. As the tribunes and the senators grew closer, plebeian senators began to routinely secure the office of tribune for members of their own families. Also around the year 350 BC, the plebeian council enacted a significant law which transferred from the consuls to the censors the power to appoint new senators. This law also required the censors to appoint any newly elected magistrate to the senate which probably resulted in a significant increase in the number of plebeian senators. This, along with the closeness between the plebeian tribunes and the senate, helped to facilitate the creation of a new plebeian aristocracy. This new plebeian aristocracy soon merged with the old patrician aristocracy, creating a combined patricio-plebeian aristocracy. The old aristocracy existed through the force of law, because only patricians had been allowed to stand for high office. 
Now, however, the new aristocracy existed due to the organization of society, and as such, this order could only be overthrown through a revolution. In 287 BC, the plebeians seceded to the Janiculum Hill. To end the secession, a law was passed, which ended the requirement that the patrician senators consent before a bill could be brought before the plebeian council for a vote. The ultimate significance of this law was in the fact that it robbed the patricians of their final weapon over the plebeians. The result was that the ultimate control over the state fell, not onto the shoulders of democracy, but onto the shoulders of the new patricio-plebeian aristocracy. By the middle of the 2nd century BC, the economic situation for the average plebeian had declined significantly. Farmers became bankrupted, and soon masses of unemployed plebeians began flooding into Rome, and thus into the ranks of the legislative assemblies, where their economic status usually led them to vote for the candidate who offered him the most. A new culture of dependency was emerging, which would look to any populist leader for relief. In 88 BC, an aristocratic senator named Lucius Cornelius Sulla was elected consul, and soon left for a war in the east. When a tribune revoked Sulla's command of the war, Sulla brought his army back to Italy, marched on Rome, secured the city and left for the east again. In 83 BC he returned to Rome, and captured the city a second time. In 82 BC, he made himself dictator, and then used his status as dictator to pass a series of constitutional reforms that were intended to strengthen the Senate. In 80 BC he resigned his dictatorship, and by 78 BC he was dead. While he thought that he had firmly established aristocratic rule, his own career had illustrated the fatal weakness in the constitution, that it was the army, and not the senate, which dictated the fortunes of the state. In 70 BC, the generals Pompey Magnus and Marcus Licinius Crassus were both elected consul, and quickly dismantled Sulla's constitution. In 62 BC Pompey returned to Rome from battle in the east, and soon entered into an agreement with Julius Caesar. Caesar and Pompey, along with Crassus, established a private agreement, known as the First Triumvirate. Under the agreement, Pompey's arrangements were to be ratified, Crassus was to be promised a future consulship, and Caesar was to be promised the consulship in 59 BC, and then the governorship of Gaul immediately afterwards. In 54 BC, violence began sweeping the city, and in 53 BC Crassus was killed. In January 49 BC, the Senate passed a resolution which declared that if Caesar did not lay down his arms by July of that year, he would be considered an enemy of the Republic. In response, Caesar quickly crossed the Rubicon with his veteran army, and marched towards Rome. Caesar's rapid advance forced Pompey, the consuls and the Senate to abandon Rome for Greece, and allowed Caesar to enter the city unopposed. By 48 BC, after having defeated the last of his major enemies, Julius Caesar wanted to ensure that his control over the government was undisputed. He assumed these powers by increasing his own authority, and by decreasing the authority of Rome's other political institutions. Caesar held the office of Roman dictator, and alternated between the consulship and the proconsulship. In 48 BC, Caesar was given the powers of a plebeian tribune, which made his person sacrosanct, gave him the power to veto the Senate, and allowed him to dominate the legislative process. After Caesar was assassinated in 44 BC, Mark Antony formed an alliance with Caesar's adopted son and great-nephew, Gaius Octavian. Along with Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, they formed an alliance known as the Second Triumvirate, and held powers that were nearly identical to the powers that Caesar had held under his constitution. While the conspirators who had assassinated Caesar were defeated at the Battle of Philippi in 42 BC, the peace that resulted was only temporary. 
Antony and Octavian fought against each other in one last battle in 31 BC. Antony was defeated, and in 30 BC he committed suicide. In 29 BC, Octavian returned to Rome as the unchallenged master of the state. The reign of Octavian, whom history remembers as Augustus, the first Roman emperor, marked the dividing line between the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. By the time this process was complete, Rome had completed its transition from a city-state with a network of dependencies, to the capital of an empire.